So we're talking about the greatness of God all year, and our year doesn't just include the calendar. It kind of runs from July through uh, July. So uh, we're right in the middle. We're kind of at the midpoint of our year, focusing on the greatness of God. And today, we're continuing a sermon series called Encounters with God. We only have one more week after today in this series, and then we'll start a new series called The Making of Heaven and Earth from Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And the creation, uh, the work of creation uh, in the Bible and in history certainly is evidence of the greatness of God. But as we approach this series on in the encounters with God in the Bible, as we said all along the way, that when God shows up, when he makes an appearance, it's known as a theophany or a divine appearing in the Bible. And these encounters, these theophanies are wild stories. Last week we dealt with uh, one of the wildest stories in our series, uh, the encounter that Ezekiel had in exile in Babylon with the Lord high and lifted up. God never seems to act how we would expect him to act or do what we would expect him to do. And so, but these encounters reveal just the stunning character of who God is, what God is like, and his heart for a world that is lost without him, even for his enemies, as hard as that is to believe. Well, today we're making a big jump from the Old Testament in the Bible to the New Testament, uh, and, but you uh, Bible scholars might notice we're skipping over the gospel accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John at the beginning of the New Testament. So Christians believe that Jesus uh, wasn't just a great man or a great teacher or even a great prophet, but that he was the only person ever to have two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. Jesus was fully God and fully man. So the whole life of Jesus, in one sense, is an encounter with God, a theophany. Now, the scholars tend to label it a Christophany, uh, but that should not uh, slow us down at all. But given the fact that we spent all of last year, the whole last year, uh, our focus was the person and work of Jesus. We talked a lot about uh, the person and work of Jesus. We did a lot of work in the gospel. So we're going to skip over those today to the conversion, as I said, of the Apostle Paul, or as he was known in uh, and around Jerusalem, Saul. Well, okay, so these uh, appearances uh, that we'll consider today and the next week are not the Jesus meek and mild of his first coming. Jesus came in Christmas, we just celebrated, in the dark of night to a small town called Bethlehem, the announcement was made not to the kings and princes and queens of the land, but to shepherds. Jesus, his first coming was marked by humility. Well, these appearances are not that. They are Jesus high and lifted up. Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of the Almighty, the King of heaven and earth today. And today we get to unpack this famous encounter with God, the Son, and Saul on the road to Damascus. In this encounter, we'll see that God is the great redeemer, even that of his enemies. No one else is like him. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, you can take it and open it to the book of Acts, chapter 9, starting in verse 1, and we'll put the scripture on the screens for you as well. Acts 9, starting with verse 1. Let's read this together. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They had heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Let's pause here. All right, so... All the way back on Christmas Eve, which kind of feels like a long time ago after New Year's Eve, uh, I said, I think, that Luke uh, was a physician who became a Christian through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Luke became sort of a Christian historian. Uh, he 
was from, I think, the city, we think, the city of Ephesus in modern Turkey. But after becoming a Christian, Luke did a careful investigation into the life and ministry of Jesus by something that we would probably think to do today, by going and talking to the eyewitnesses who were there, who heard and saw everything that Jesus had said and done. And this investigation led, it resulted in the book of Luke in the Bible, which we uh, read from at Christmas Eve. Uh, And that book, the book of Luke, is all about what happened during the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. Who was this man? Well, the book of Acts in the Bible is like Luke part two. It's really what happened next? What happened after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus back into heaven? What happened with the message of good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ? What happened then in the early church? So much of what happened next has to do with this man introduced here named Saul. Now, Saul is the Hebrew form of his name, which makes sense because we start this chapter uh, of his story in Jerusalem in a Hebrew context. But as Saul was sent out to the Gentiles and traveled throughout the Greco-Roman culture of the Roman Empire in all sorts of places, he used the Greek form of his name, which was Paul. So we generally refer to him as the Apostle Paul, but we could call him Saul, and we will do so mostly here because that's how, at this point in the scriptures, he is referred. So Luke starts this incredible encounter story with Saul He says, breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. That is, against Christians, against the church of Jesus Christ. And these murderous threats weren't uh, hollow threats. Back in chapter 8 of the book of Acts, Luke writes that Saul had approved of the public killing of Stephen, who was an early deacon in the church of, of Jerusalem, and who was the first Christian martyr first of many. Well, after Stephen's death as this zealous young religious leader, Saul launched himself into a widespread persecution of the Christian church. And Luke says, Saul began going, began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women, all inclusive in his persecution, and he put them into prison. Later in Acts, Paul described his mindset during this time, and I think this is psychologically interesting. He said, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Notice he didn't say Jesus Christ, for Christ would refer to Jesus being Israel's chosen Messiah. Well, Paul rejected that belief. And Paul says, that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed. This is Paul in his own words. I was so obsessed with persecuting them, Christians, that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. So this, it was this man with arrest warrants in hand who was traveling the approximate 135 miles from Jerusalem north to Damascus, the capital city of Syria today. Now, apparently, it was likely that there would be Christians in the city of Damascus, which is interesting from a historical perspective. The Christian gospel started to radiate out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and eventually to the ends of the earth, just as Luke said that it would back in Acts 1.8. Apparently, at this point, there were Christians as far as Damascus. But as we see here in this passage, before anyone was known as a Christian, Uh, No one at this point was really known as a Christian. They were known at this point as followers of the way. And that is because they were known to follow the way of Jesus. Well, back in verse 3, it says, As Saul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Okay, if, if you've been with us for the last couple months, you'll start to recognize the signs of a theophany about to happen. And just as in many of the other encounters uh, with God that we've looked at, how does Saul respond to this appearing of God, this divine appearing? 
oh, Lord, this is so nice of you to appear before me on my journey. It was strengthening me to go to Damascus and kill these Christians. No, he falls down on his face before the Lord. If God showed up today, you would fall down too. Because he is great. Now, it's fascinating to me how the Lord responds to this man. He says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute my followers? Why do you persecute my church? He says, why do you persecute me? Wait a minute. Saul's got to be thinking, I'm not persecuting. Wait, sorry. I'm not persecuting you, Lord. <laughs> well, hang on a second. Who am I talking to? Saul says, who are you, Lord? Saul is an expert in the Old Testament scriptures. He would have known that this was a theophany that was unfolding before him. But he wasn't working against the Lord God Almighty, was he? Had he gotten things so twisted around? I'm persecuting the followers of Jesus, this dangerous fraud, this blasphemer. Who are you, Lord? He asks in verse 5. <laughs> well, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, it's, it's hard when your deeply held beliefs, when your convictions are upended by new information. All at once, Saul could not continue to hold to the belief that Jesus was a fraud and a blasphemer when he came face to face with the risen Jesus and realized he had all the power glory, and honor of heaven. No doubt Saul experienced profound disorientation in the face of the crumbling deconstruction of his former beliefs about Jesus. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, Saul. He had been completely wrong. He thought that he had been working for God, but now he realized in an instant that he had been working against the living God. His companions had, knew something had happened, but this was not an appearing for them. It was for Saul. Saul was very clear about what he had heard and seen that day. As a result, and I think I would be the same way, he was so stunned Physically, and in every other capacity, he was blinded and refused to eat or drink for days afterward. Let's continue in verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. Here I am. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man named, from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Oh, I love that the Lord knows that. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. He has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Wow, so Ananias is called by Jesus to be a minister to Saul, the infamous persecutor of the church. How would you feel about that? It's a nice thought of Jesus' teaching to love your enemies until you need to actually love an enemy. Ananias is understandably confused. Who, who, sorry, who do you want me to go to, Lord? Um, to Saul, Saul of Tarsus? We've all heard about him. Lord, don't you know who he is? He's your enemy. 
And he has authority, he has power from none other than the high priest and the Jewish ruling council of Jerusalem. But Jesus says, oh, enemy? No, not anymore. He's mine. Saul will be my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles, all of the non-Jewish people, and to their kings, but also to the people of Israel. Now, this statement is astonishing to me on multiple levels. Just think of all that this interaction reveals about who God is and what God is like. In this story, it's clear, it's obvious that the risen Jesus, high and lifted up, is the high king of heaven, as we sang this morning. But he, in all that he is, in all of that 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 reveals, also knows who Saul and Ananias are. Jesus knows where they've come from. Saul from Tarsus. Jesus knows them by name. Ananias, I, I told Saul that a man named Ananias was going to come, so it's either you or somebody named Ananias. Jesus even knows if they intended to harm him, and he knows how to turn their intention of harm to good. But if this is true then, if this was true then, is it not true today? Does Jesus not know who you are? Does he not know where you've been or what he has planned for you? Does he not know how to take our evil and turn it out for our good? Now, this is incredible, unbelievable. Jesus never lost an ounce of his kingly authority or his reign or rule in the kingdom of God or his ability to execute his plans perfectly even during the persecution of his people. Why? Because yet again we realize he is not far off and removed from our world. He didn't wind up the clock and let it run. He is near. He is here. He is involved. He knows you by name. Now, of course, this is nothing new. If you've ever read any part of the Bible, this is very consistent from start to finish. But it is shocking to realize that this is the claim of the scriptures. However, it's not all rainbows and light in this theophany for Saul. In verse 16, what did Jesus say? This is, this is a scary sentence. I will show him, Ananias, how much he must suffer for my name. So Saul was an enemy of God, but now he was a child of God. But that wouldn't keep him from suffering. Saul would suffer terribly for the name of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 11, later in Saul's life, toward the end of his life, he wrote, Quote, five times I, was, I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. The 39 lashes were thought to be the maximum amount of punishment a human body could take without dying. Five times I received that. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. For me, after the second time, I would walk the rest of my life. <laughs> Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Can you imagine? I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone, often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the concern, pressure of my concern for all of the churches. But to Saul, 
just like the prophets of old, this hardship didn't disprove his newfound relationship with God. It actually was part of the calling that he had received in following one who was crucified, died, and buried. He told Timothy, another minister of the gospel, a young pastor, join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. In one sense, Saul had lost everything when he became a Christian. Everything. He lost his job. He lost his credibility. He lost what he thought was his religion. He lost his home in Jerusalem. Probably all of his friends, if not if not most of his friends, but even with all that he had lost, he could say, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. On paper, it looked like Saul had lost everything. But in reality, and how he looked at all of the pain and hardship that he was to experience as a Christian, he was blessed beyond measure. What a perspective. Jesus Jesus was real, and he was the Lord, and he knew everything about Saul, but instead of treating him how his sins deserved, he encountered a God who was willing to love and serve and save even his enemies. He came face to face with the light of the glory of the grace of God. Name one other religious system that is anything like this. No other God is like Jesus. What happened next? Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. A simple statement of a brother being obedient to the word of the Lord. Jesus said, go, and he went. Placing his hands on Saul, despite all of his reservations, most likely, he said, brother Saul, The Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God, Who would have thought? (laughs) That was not his intention, if you remember, when he left Jerusalem for Damascus. At once he began to preach that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. No longer Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ. (laughs) What a turnaround. (laughs) What a dramatic reversal. The enemy of Christ becomes the mighty apostle to the Gentiles for Christ. The one who hated Christians and was notorious for their persecution becomes a Christian and gives his life to help other people follow Jesus. It really is hard to explain Saul's testimony here any other way unless the gospel is true. But if Jesus really appeared to Saul, if he really had an encounter with God on the road to Damascus, If God revealed himself to be Jesus, then this this reversal, this dramatic reversal, Saul's conversion to Christianity is very rational. It, It makes complete sense. This is what God can do. But actually, really, this is what God has always done. 
The story of salvation, going back to the beginning of the Bible, doesn't start with us. It doesn't start with people who are just super smart and sit down and figure out who God is and what God does in the world. It doesn't start with people who are deeply hungry to know God and seek him out and find him. It actually starts, the story of salvation actually starts with a God who for some reason loves people, but surprisingly, not just the people that love him back. It starts with a God who actually loves even his enemies like Saul. and is willing to move heaven and earth to pursue them in order to rescue them. Well, in this way, the Apostle Paul's experience on the road to Damascus is just the perfect picture of the spiritual journey of every single man, woman, and child in Christ. It's a story of a dramatic reversal and a story of spiritual revelation in Jesus and of the mighty grace of God to save sinners even sinners breathing out murderous threats against the people of Jesus. This is our story in Christ, too. Now, maybe the circumstances of your conversion didn't quite have the same sound and light show that Saul's had in this passage in Acts, but it's really the same thing. While we were yet sinners, we're told that Christ lived for us and died for us and rose again for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ reigns and rules over us, even today. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Saul knew that verse. I guarantee it. He probably had most of the book of Exodus memorized as a Pharisee. He had heard of the Lord, but now he had seen him, as Job said. Well, my final observation from this encounter with God is this. The impact of Ananias on Paul's life is proof that it doesn't matter how smart you are. It does not matter what your spiritual resume looks like. If you too had a conversion experience with the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus, it doesn't matter how impressive your experience of the power or the presence of God has been. Everyone, everywhere, throughout all time, needs the ministry of other brothers and sisters in the church. Jesus could have healed Paul immediately. He did have experience healing the blind. But he said, you need, you need your brother. You need him and others as you learn the way of Jesus. There are no orphans in the family of God. There ought not be any lone wolves either. Even the mighty apostle Paul needed Ananias to pray for him. And what? To heal him, to instruct him, to baptize him, to vouch for him among other rightly skeptical believers in the church? If you believe that being a Christian means it's just you and Jesus, you will miss out on so much spiritual power and blessings and transformation besides, of course, the commands, the actual commands of Christ. It is impossible to be obedient to the commands of Christ by yourself. So you need the church, but the church needs you. It's how this works. Well, today, consider this. Jesus knows you. He knows your name. He knows everything that you've been through, but he will not treat you as your sins deserve. You, like Paul, might suffer greatly. We might suffer greatly. But when we understand who Jesus is, like Paul, 
you and I can count it all joy to be found in him and to be counted among his people. This is who God is. This is what God does even today. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, sometimes we foolishly forget that you are high and lifted up today, no longer meek and mild, although you are gentle with us. No longer come with humility, but one day, Lord, we look forward to the time when you will return in glory. Thank you for the story of our brother Saul, a murderer, a blasphemer, an idolater, turned son of God by your grace through faith in Jesus. What a story. But it's our story as well. We thank you, we love you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.